Continuing the notes on Chapter 8, we'll now talk about energy, uh, we'll talk about energy and ATP. So realize that various kinds of reactions that occur in cells are either exergonic or endergonic. The ones that are exergonic, of course, that means they're giving energy off, they have a release of free energy, and exergonic reactions tend to be spontaneous. An endergonic reaction is going to absorb free energy, and it's non-spontaneous. It's going to have to have an input of energy to get it started. Um, here we have graphs that show the difference in free energy in both exergonic and endergonic reactions. In exergonic reactions, we'll start off with the reactants at a high energy level. Energy is given off, and the products have a lower energy. And so you have the energy. This shows the difference in energy that's released. In this case, delta G is less than zero which means it is a negative value, so that could be a spontaneous reaction. Endergonic reactions require an input of energy, so you start off with the reactants in a lower energy state, and then you add energy, and the products end up in a higher energy state, and so the amount of energy required here is a positive value, delta G is greater than zero, so they're definitely non-spontaneous. Reactions in those closed systems eventually will get to to equilibrium and won't do any more work. And so you have to realize, of course, that cells are not in equilibrium. They're always open, and there's always a constant flow of materials into and out of the cell. Um, remember we talked about catabolic and anabolic processes. The catabolic pathways release free energy in a series of reactions. And um, they, um, they go in a series of coupled reactions to release actually more energy than would normally be available. So let's look at an analogy of hydroelectric systems. When you have a closed or isolated hydro hydroelectric system, it's going to produce electricity as long as that water is flowing across the turbine to turn the turbine. Once the water reaches equilibrium in this closed system, um, then you're going to then there's not going to be any more flow, which means no more electricity will be generated. In this case, your delta G will be equal to zero. If you have an open system with an input of water and an outflow of water, then the water is never going to reach equilibrium, and so you can continue to turn the turbine and generate electricity. This would be a spontaneous occurrence, and this is, in this case, the delta G would be zero. But what if we had a multi-step open system? If we have a multi-step open system, then at each location where we have the turbine here, we can be generating electricity. And so we can end up actually producing more electricity with the same input and outflow that we had in the simpler system. And this is basically what cells do. They undergo a series of reactions, and each step in the reaction releases more of the energy. Um, we do this in cells by using a molecule called ATP. Okay, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, and it is the cell's currency, or the money, basically, that, that the cell spends on energy. The, to do the work of the cell, okay, you have all different kinds of things that need to be done, some examples shown here on the screen, um, but, you, but you have to have uh, an exergonic process to produce the energy to drive the endergonic Pro processes that need to occur in the cell. And this is called energy coupling, and we use, we use ATP for that. ATP has three main parts. It has ribose, which is a sugar, adenine, which is a nitrogen base, and three phosphate groups. Uh, if you take the main part of the ATP molecule, the one phosphate and the ribose and the adenine, those three parts th there together make up a nucleotide for RNA. But ADP uh, the adenosine part, the, ribo the adenine and ribose part, um, is part of the um, nucleotide, but then when you add these other phosphates on there, it changes the character of the molecule. So we have ATP, and what we can do is we can hydrolyze ATP by addition, the addition of water, okay, to remove one of those phosphates, plus some energy, and the amount of energy that is, that is released there is a good handy amount for cells to use. Not only that, we can regenerate ADP to ATP through other cellular processes, and we can use these mo molecules all over, all over again. And so we can have a shuttling, basically, of the energy either to, from ATP to ADP or from ADP to ATP uh, to power the various kind of processes in the cells. Um, we break the bonds, of course, by means of hydrolysis, similar to what we saw in terms of hydrolysis in uh, other organic molecules. And then when that terminal phosphate is broken off, it releases energy. Um, 
because what is happening is it's not from the phosphate bonds themselves, but from changing the the the, uh, elect the chemical from a state of lower free energy, I mean from the higher free energy to lower free energy. Um, all of these kind of processes in the cell are used by are powered by the hydrolysis of ATP. And so we're going to look at a series of coupled reactions or some examples of coupled reactions where you have the, uh, the hydrolysis of ATP to drive those endergonic reactions of making other molecules. Here we have the conversion of glutamic acid to glutamine. Glutamic acid and glutamine are both um, amino acids. And in order to make glutamine from glutamic acid, you have to add ammonia. So it's going to take an addition, this is an anabolic process, okay, we're building molecules, and so what we're going to have to have is a positive input of 3.4 kilocalories per mole of uh, energy to, to create, to make this happen. If we couple that with the hydrolysis of ATP, okay, what we get is we take the glutamic acid and we take off one of that one of the, that terminal phosphate here and attach it to the glutamic acid making what's called a phosphorylated intermediate then we also have ADP okay then we can add the ammonia in there to take the place of the phosphate to make glutamine and we have ADP and inorganic phosphate left over so what we have here instead of this reaction, this reaction, which takes 3.4 kilocalories per mole, this one produces 7.3 kilocalories per mole of energy that gives us a net gain of negative 3.9 kilocalories per mole of energy. So we have a much, uh, you know, we get more than we, than we had to use to start the process. And that's very beneficial for the cell because it it's, releases energy for cell to use and it doesn't, ha um, it doesn't have to use as much energy as it would normally have to do. ATP does this by phosphorylation, okay, that's transferring the phosphate to some other molecule, and we'll see this over and over again as we look at the various processes in the cell, and we see these phosphorylated intermediate molecules in, in numerous processes, including cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Here we see some other examples of of ATP being used to produce this phosphorylated molecule. So here we have a transport protein. protein. This is an active transport process going from lower concentration to higher, probably some kind of ion. And by transferring that phosphate to this molecule, it can changes the configuration or the shape of the molecule, allowing for the pumping of the, of the um, ions or whatever the molecule is from, from lower concentration to higher. When that's finished, when our solute molecules have moved here, then the, then the inorganic phosphate is released and the molecule goes back to its original state and we have our ADP and PI or inorganic phosphate. For transport work, here's a vesicle in the cell. This is one of those walking vesicles moving on a motor protein. By adding the, the phosphate from the ATP to the motor protein, that causes it to move along the track there, the, the microtubule and move the vesicle along, releasing ADP and inorganic phosphate. So the whole thing is that the covalent bonding of the, of the motor protein and the, and the phosphorylation of the transport proteins both can be used, it can use the energy from ATP to do the work of the cell. Now ATP is also help handy because it can be regenerated. All you have to do is add another phosphate back to it. And so there are various catabolic reactions in the cell that can be used to phosphorylate AD, ADP to ATP. And that produces something called the ATP, ATP cycle. Basically the energy is going to transfer back and forth from one process to the other. So when we have energy from a catab catabolic reaction, then we can add that to ADP and PI to make ATP. We can hydrolyze ATP to release energy for cellular work of various kinds. So this is an exergonic process, this is an endergonic process, and both of them are uh, powering the life of the cell uh, by using that energy for cell work and then regenerating ATP as a storage molecule to be used again.